<laughs> now, um, uh, we are going to continue now with the final discussion um, that allows to reflect on uh, that what you have listened today and also to find a way to grasp the complexity and the various contributions and the various perspectives. And uh, the audience is very much invited to join after Denise uh, Ferrer de Silva is going to uh, respond and to open up um, the space of reflection by also providing a, a new perspective to the presentation. So please do not leave. <laughs> it's just another contribution of the day that is going to close um, our, um, uh, our conference today. And um, all the contributors are going to be on stage. Also, uh, we are going to put Milica on the screen. But let me introduce first, please, maybe also, I mean, if the audience is growing a bit slower, a uh, bit uh, smaller, just really come closer to the stage, because I think it is helping us to have more intimacy and also more like an exchange, maybe, of ideas uh, and questions and concerns. And um, it's a little bit uh, going back and forth now, but please uh, stay with your attention for my introduction of Denise Ferreira da Silva. <laughs> Denise Ferreira da Silva holds the inaugural chair in ethics at the School of Business and Management and she holds the directorship of the Center for Ethics and Politics at Queen Mary University of London. And from a feminist and black radical perspective, her writing addresses the conceptual, political, ethical challenges of the global present. Denise Ferreira de Silva intervenes in the fields of political theory, critical legal theory, critical racial and ethnic studies, global post-colonial studies, and cultural studies. Her publications include two words, A Global Idea of Race, her seminal essay, Nobody's Law, Raciality, and Violence, published in the Griffith Law Review 2009, the special issue on race, empire, and the subprime crisis, and to be and the uh, and the essay to be announced or the article scholarly article to be announced radical praxis of knowing at the limits of justice published in social text 2013 she is co-editing the Routledge book series law and the post colonial ethics politics and economic eco economy and thank you very much denise for agreeing to respond to the presentations, to listen to all the presentations of the day. And uh, I would like to invite you and all the contributors of the day on stage. And uh, we also maybe, if the space is big enough, we all can join later on also on stage. <laughs> now I think let's uh, play a bit with the spatial condition here of the Great Hall. I'm here. Can you hear okay. me? Do you want to? Uh, sorry. Do you want to? Uh, um, shall I speak in the microphone? Ah, Milica, do you want to switch on the? Yeah. Okay. So we can connect you. Uh, you are now on screen and. Um, I don't want to be on the screen, please. Okay, but you can see the, 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 the stage? I can see, I can see. It's, uh, it's, it's, ho it's horrific that I'm now, you know. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, these images now. Okay, all right. Yeah, this is Skype. Shall I put something? I mean, I can, you know what? I can oh, okay. do. Okay, nice image. Nice image from the Second World War. Yeah, maybe this is, then it's not your Skype profile. Yeah. And uh, Malcolm, thank you for all your technical facilities and support, and I need another support. Is it able that we have the um, recorded audio from uh, the table transmitted to Milica? Okay, good. Just 
So if you just could skip. Yes, this is a Gaudiya text. And this is here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll play it for you. Yeah. Oh, you're going to set up? If I play you too. There is a very strange sound. I think it's a microphone. Okay. Doreen. Yes. There is a very strange sound. You can just bring the mic out of the reach of the... Okay. Uh -huh. I don't know how to, to do with the mic. And I mean, uh, Malcolm said I should point it to you. Yes, but uh, in, it, was, it, was, it became worse like uh, a minute ago. Ah, okay. So maybe it's not better? No, no, no. Not. I cannot hear well. It's the Wi-Fi. Um, no, no. Just, you know just, what? Just point the just point the uh, the mic to the other direction. Let's, let's try and let's begin and we maybe have to check, check in between what we can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I use that? Yes, sure. Okay, well, um, Doreen, I cannot hear anything. Oh, because I'm not here. It's going to be complicated. I think we need the Yeah, I can just speak. Uh, I cannot move that one. Ah. Okay, thank you. Can I just make this quick? Uh, well, thank you, Doreen, for inviting me to uh, be part of this conversation and actually be present at these amazing, amazing presentations. Um, my, uh, my comments are divided into, I think, three parts. Um, the first two are about how I find myself coming into the conversation. So, um, so the first one is before the conversation, and I'll play a song. And then I will spend five minutes talking about how I responded to the invitation. Uh, and then I will end with a few very quick comments on the presentations, just to open the conversation, and then I'll come back again. So here is how I come into the conversation before I knew about it. Let's hope it works. Mountain Little, what he yelled before Elijah Muhammad, the comment 
From that point, um, much of my work has been developed. But the point at which uh, I engage the conversation, it's obviously the question of violence and the questioning of violence. My response to that question, or the questioning in regards to political art or art concerned with justice, is Violence is at the beginning of thinking, and it is the business of thought. So let me just start with some uh, modern thinkers, um, and then move on to where we are now. From the 17th century, we find an imaging of the scene of violence in all major philosophical statements. Hobbes and Locke imagined, imaged a state of nature to establish the necessity for the regulating and controlling forms of law and the repressive arm of the state, our juridical architectures. Newton postulated violence in nature, and always already regulated by the laws of motion, of course. The laws of mechanics, movement, is to explain much of what occurs in space-time and also much of our scientific program. Drawing from both, the, foundations, this, the foundational accounts of knowledge and morality could not but presuppose and reproduce violence. Kant's statements on knowledge, morality, and law is right, introduce mediation to arrest the possibility of violence, of affection and affect, both in the, institu in the intuitions and categories of reason, in knowledge, the moral law, immorality, and in an account of right or law that begins with the distinction, the abstract distinction between 
thine and mine. Hegel's collection of the Kantian account, which places knowledge at the core of the modern ethical program, when it narrates human existence as the unfolding of a transcendental entity coming into self-knowledge, places violence at the core of self-actualization, of becoming. Now, however, interiorized as the condition of possibility for everything, science, state, uh, law, the state, violence is the key to the, is key, sorry, to the emergence of the subject, self-consciousness in itself, for itself, for other, uh, in itself, for other, for itself. The dialectical movement is a confrontation with another, which is both negation and the realization of the I. Already violence. And of course, it's not surprising that the critiques of modern thought and existence also targeted violence. Marx, as you know, in the description of history of the, as the scene of violence, Foucault's description of the three forms of deployment of power, disciplinary, biopolitical, um, juridical, political, and the Rida in describing or stating the originary violence of writing, representation in name and classification. All these figurines of violence have what I call a juridical core, the violence of the law that is presented as necessity, early on by Locke, Hobbes, and others. The one that relies on the construction of a violent outside that enters in the names, descriptors of the, in descriptors of the other as criminal, nobodies, the drug dealer, the gang member, the terrorist, the undocumented migrant worker, the Roman people, the Romanian migrants in Italy and the UK, the Latin American migrants in the USA, the indigenous peoples, insurgents or not, All these raise a question for the political art, or the art that is political, concerned with justice. The words, the texts, the scenes, the images available to artists' creative work have been constituted by such juridical inflection, with such juridical inflection. In formulations of power as authority, energy as force, and of the other as the end of me. So Doreen's question in the opening, the introduction, how the juridical figuring of the law can connect or be re reconnects with poetry, literature, images, architecture, etc. Well, I ask, what about justice? If the postulated violence has become now, has become how, where, when we live, and the exi existing mechanisms for redress in the scene of law administration of justice and the rights, human rights, that allow us to intervene, they reproduce the founding necessary violence. So how? To political art, if exhibitions must continue, how do they address this founding violence that may be in the pieces the artists bring together in his her creation? Well, given, given how representation works for and through as violence, it is possible after now, after being present at these um, amazing presentations, maybe it's possible to rethink it in a different way. So maybe exhibitions would become expositions, expo expositions as confrontation, ex exposure, not explication, explanation, or translation. Those might be good descriptors for polit a political art. And then here, uh, Adrian talking about Genet, and I hear violation as one other descriptor that refers us to confrontation. Yasmina, refusal to represent and courage to stay with the refusal and hold on to the violence of that refusal. Paulo, the excavations, 
the excavations of the forest that reveal both the obliterating and the transforming violence that is development. Melitza and the turbo folk kept making, I was thinking transformation, transgression, transformation, transgression. Um, so to open, I would like us to reflect about whether or not confrontation with the, these other variations might be a way to begin to speak about political art that will not reproduce the violence that it is in explanation or representation. you have been introducing. Um, I mean, this is where I think we find a way to connect all the presentations with this mode of making public and to present something in public with a concern for the politics of representation and also representation as the high-end modernist, Western modernistic claim politically and culturally. Like representation is like, comes with the enlightenment principle as the major Western modernistic uh, force as a principle also for democracy. And uh, maybe we can begin um, at that complication with the exhibition as a mode of confrontation that you have introduced with exposition. And also the term exposition relates quite beautifully to to take a position. So to take a position in uh, the, um, as uh, Bazam has suggested it, take position in just in um, uh, I have to look it up again, sorry. <laughs> to take a position on the place, on the place of justice in art. So uh, what does it uh, kind of introduce, these acts, to take the position to X position, I mean to uh, exceed a certain circuit. I mean Derrida, he has introduced the figure of the exorbitant this notion of the act that always goes, refers to the para of the doxa, to that what is not part of the regulating, dominating principle, but it's not an outside, somewhere like far away, but it's connected, there is a link between those kind of spheres. And um, can, we, can we begin, uh, I mean this also seems to have walked with Militza's reflection on this location and the exhibition. Maybe, uh, I mean, I'm going to moderate, but uh, uh, maybe I can uh, ask, if, like, maybe Adrienne could <laughs> um, take up that, I mean, you introduced the confrontation that I think, uh, or like you mentioned, um, these... Um, concept of confrontation, if I understood Denny's in the correct way. Yeah, thinking uh, of confrontation in terms of Adrian's um, presentation of Genet and even my reading of Genet uh, preceding uh, Adrian's uh, presentation, um, I felt like I was kind of in drag as I read it, um, especially after uh, you quoted his saying that I am I'm a black man. And I thought, oh, oops, he's a black woman uh, who is reading the, the English translation of a French text with a Portuguese accent, and then there is no way of standing there. But uh, in the case of Genet, what, what called my attention was, and, and brought me immediately to the confrontation, which is a confrontation that I signaled with Immortal Techniques song, is his, his refusal um, to inhabit a 
given name to use Derrida's uh, term. Not a proper name, a common name. The son, the loving son, uh, the white man. Um, and that, and, and the embracing, and, and of course the distinction between uh, murder, and, murder and assassination or violence and brutality already points to the exposition of the excess. Brutality is excessive precisely because it's not engaged, right? It's not part of the, the violence that it is productive because it has no orientation, just it's done. So in that sense, I find it a confrontation um, through excess, but excess standing before as opposed to responding. <coughs> um, I'm looking for names. Uh, Denise, yes. Uh, no, well, I, I don't know exactly where to start, but um, uh, first of all, I, I, um, I came with that little uh, piece from the Thief Journal by Genet. And um, I don't know why exactly, but I didn't want to read it myself. I wanted somebody else to read it. And uh, I asked Doreen first, but uh, I thought that she felt uncomfortable to read it. I don't know exactly why. So, and then I, <coughs> I asked Denise, and of course, uh, it fits very well with what you mentioned after, you know, uh, of Jeunet saying that he was a, a black person with a pink skin. But uh, I really like the, this text because I, for me it's, it's super violent. It's a turbo violence. Um, and although nothing really happens, but uh, the confrontation of the son and the mother there is, is very strong. And then, it, if I can link it to another part of uh, my intervention is you know, I, now I, I realize that you know Genet is talking about the, the what I call the ABC of violence, and uh, he's using the example of the mother uh, learning is uh, teaching his son to 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 speak, and this is very strange because uh, Genet never experienced that uh, since he didn't know his mother. And then, so all this is very complicated in in, in Genet's uh, biography and work. But I think, and I will stop there. But I think the, the the issue of the name and Doreen was kind enough to send me a, a little text by Derrida uh, on that on, on on that issue and and on the proper name. And I want just to say that when I was working on on Genet, nobody knows at the time what was his, his, uh, his father's name. And then there were more research being done while I was working. And, um, and between the first edition of my book and the second, 10 years later, the name of Jeunet's father appeared finally. And uh, I, I don't know if you know that his, his real father, his genetical father name was white, uh, blanc en français. So his, his, the father, his father's name was Blanc. And uh, so once again, it's, uh, it's amazing when you think that all his work is addressing the, the, the whites and the violence of, of, of the whites. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I had a question for, if, I, if we can continue the, the ring, I, I had a question for uh, Mil Milica Tomic, I don't know if she's still there. Hi. Okay, you are very good. <laughs> uh, I really love the, this uh, ready-made performance that you you showed us. But I had a question uh, because at the end you were very fast uh, by saying that uh, this singer. Uh, I mean, there was a connection that wasn't clear for me between this this singer, this woman, uh, her body and the genocide of the Yugoslavian, Yugoslavian war. And you, you, you were saying very briefly, very brutal, brutally, 
uh, that there was the link between the construction of the female body in this uh, turbo pop or something and the invisible uh, war and genocide. So could you be more, uh, um, could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit for me? Yes, yes, I can. But uh, may I just say something very briefly because I want to think about the idea of exposure uh, instead exhibiting because this is somehow um, uh, it also refers very much uh, uh, to Antonia Maiacha and Ivan Abago and their idea of uh, of uh, uh, let's say uh, can we present without exhibiting without producing another object or perpetuating actually the uh, the the politics of for example of violence if it's being exposed so they see and which i think it's really important exposure in the contrast to exhibition that it does not imply an agent a subject that exposes something to someone but the subject herself or himself embraces the act of radical exposure which means that we are exposed to each other so this brings a totally different, and uh, then I can go back uh, also to this uh, turbo performance. And for that reason, I think it's really crucial and so important to speak about exposi ex exposition or exposing instead of exhibiting. Yeah, so thank you very much for, uh, for saying this. Um, and... Uh, uh, yes, I would, I would, I would love to say something about this because uh, it was very. Uh, I really, I had the feeling, you know, I, in a moment I was lost, uh, totally. I felt totally alone on the screen without anybody. <laughs> I, I feel also now because I'm sitting in my studio and don't have a, f a, f a feeling of of, of a, that I'm connected with you at all. So I feel a bit, uh, you know, lost in the space. And uh, uh, so I, I, I was running maybe uh, to the end of this talk uh, uh, very much. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, uh, so, okay, the discrepancy between the media representation that is a turbo folk star who was built actually and the reality which was war, ethnic cleansing, genocide, etc., that was never present in the public sphere. It was never present in the media. It was actually everything that was performed in the, in the former Yugoslavia and Serbia running the war all around uh, and producing also the politics of the war permanently already before the war, was actually totally, um, let's say, hidden from the from the uh, from the public sphere. Uh, so this discrepancy between the media representation, which is actually the turbo folk star, and the turbo folk music that was present all the time in the media, and that was actually. Um, talking about our society and this reality, the uncanny of the real life, had actually, at the same time, they support and nurture each other, so these two different positions, thus representing two sides of the same coin, which means that this war, ethnic cleansing, genocide was never present, in any way, but therefore the construction of the new female body, which was represented through the turbo folk female start, was just the projection of the world that was invisible. So the construction of the female body, body was actually a screen in the public sphere that was protected the Serbian nation from the reality. 
I don't know if it's so. Um, if 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 I can say something more, I don't know if I answered your question or is it still like not enough. Uh, you you did. Me? You did. Thank you very much. That's so okay. thank you for asking this. Yes. <laughs> But uh, also to say, I mean, why, why is it today this genre so popular among young people and among everybody in former Yugoslavia? The victims and the perpetrators, so everybody. Because we could say also that Turbo Folk is the, is the other name of the trauma. And this is exactly that what connects. So. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's great that you are saying that because I, I just wanted to add to, to my question and to your answer that I'm also asking the question because to, to put it very, very briefly, the Genet is very old for me. You know, I work on Genet a long time ago, maybe 20 years ago. And now I, uh, I'm not working on Genet anymore. And uh, by the way, I, I mean, I just finished a book on Marcel Duchamp. And, uh, and I asked the question because I also, uh, in, this, uh, in that book, I'm trying to, to make the connection between the last piece of Duchamp, which was made between 1946 and 1966, the étant donné, given, and the Second World War. And I think what you just say about the the piece you did, I mean, not the piece you did, but this, this woman body being the projection of the world that was invisible is exactly the same for, for Given by, by Marcel Duchamp. But I won't talk about that now, but just to, to, to add one thing, you, you, you mentioned trauma, trauma, and exa this is exactly what I'm trying to work on now. And, and trauma is precisely the the violence with no words, you know, the Levinas, for example, is, is defining trauma as being behind or behind logos. So there is no logos for the trauma. And so when we are talking about violence today, with all kind of violence, uh, geographical, uh, historical, poetical, uh, linguistic, etc. Uh, but then there is the, the, the violence of the, the trauma, which, which, which has no words, and it, which is very difficult to, to, to talk about. And so maybe you, this is what you, you wanted to address also. And by the way, you are invisible to us, and, and for me, it's very pleasant to speak to an invisible person. I like it very much. We could talk, I could talk like hours, like this, because I don't feel any pressure, any, any violence when it's like that, you know? It's much more difficult with everybody here, for me. <laughs> yes, Mina, uh, we, we talked briefly after your presentation, but um, I would like to expand on what um, I said, even though I'm not going to repeat what I said to you. Um, that was, uh, how, do I, how do I begin it? Uh, well, I want to ask about the, the, the complications and the trouble that comes that come with the refusal uh, of the one who is there presenting without representing in the ways. So can you talk a bit about that as an artist? Yeah, maybe what I can say is that there's different layers no, of, of refusal because I guess the, the refusal starts somehow with this um, was this violence I feel being responsible for something that was entrusted to me by somehow coincidence, no? by a work I followed and I continued following, and suddenly I'm, I'm responsible for, for, for photographs that somebody has entrusted me and of which I have digital copies, but I find myself in a situation of impossibility of actually doing what I'm eventually expected to do with these images. And then there is the other refusal that comes as another layer over this, which is actually the, 
the context of the art world and this institutional kind of art world where we finally, I mean, I was <laughs> saying it as a little joke, but yes, we're referring many times, I mean, today two times only, but in other moments I, I hear speakers referring to examples that that come from the planes, yes, because people are flying around the world and, and filling programs of, of um, art events, biennials, uh, filling the program of museums, etc. And here is also a, a refusal because somehow I find it very violent to be this point on a program and to have to think if um, what I'm talking about will interest somebody or uh, offend somebody or not. I mean, I mean, this is not what I'm, I'm thinking about, but somehow I find it also interesting to see how you... It's very difficult to, to ex actually exist in this and outside of this. And yeah, so I guess it's these different levels of, of refusal that come together and that make me really be unproductive and spending lots of time with these photographs and turning around them and dematerializing them in, in many senses. I mean, this today was one um, experiment that um, I guess it's a, is a, is a process of trying out things with, with these images. And um, yeah, and it's even when talking and responding, I feel I'm unproductive. Um, yeah, I don't know if I responded a little bit to your question. Yeah, Jean-Luc Godard said in a, a short film called uh, jean jacques Dimash and the question whether we can change the image, whether there's a possibility to change the image or whether the image itself rejects to be altered, to be changed. And he says that the image is an occupied territory in terms of its constructedness and its inscriptions, codifications, and so on. And... Um, I think uh, this is like a, a link between uh, what Yasmin said and uh, Milica, and what I heard about Milica's, uh, there were also Adrienne kind of uh, related towards this kind of double function, a double, double function or maybe a multiple function of the image itself, that the construction of the female body that turns into an image, which at the same time becomes a projection screen for uh, the concept of, uh, well, for, for a society, also for, I mean, the society and this, the, the Serbian society. And at the same time, what Milica has been introducing, this highly emancipatory potential that also arrives from um, that image that had been constructed. So I think there are like these double functions. I think it again is uh, this question of from which perspective and place do we or do I speak from when I address what kind of layer or image is to be uh, activated? And that also might link with Paul to some extent. No, 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 please, please, please go ahead. No, I, I was just thinking of this question of um, responsibility, actually. And so I sometimes wonder, I mean, how this question of responsibility actually comes together with the network of the art industry, for example. And Doreen, I think, was asking this question in her introductory text, like, um, if you, you can better recall it than I do, like, who do we speak for, who are we to speak um, or to defend uh, something or someone when talking about political art. I don't know, you, you would better cite it than I do because I don't remember, remember the words. And, um, and then Milica actually was also addressing a question in, in, in this direction and I was wondering actually if she was bringing together or talking about art as necessarily being something that happens in an in institutional context. And so I'm a little bit wondering if actually part of the violence is the institutional context anyways, and in the artwork also, but not really addressed because constantly form tries to, to challenge it. 
And I wonder um, how art finally could exist outside of this context, and if here um, there would be a possibility or a potential to address something like violence also in a different way. Maybe to connect uh, to the idea if violence could be addressed in a different way, um, I would just make a, a, a question. Denise said uh, violence is, at the, in the Western tradition of philosophy, violence is at the beginning of thought. Uh, as if we were gradually progressing towards a moment in which this violence would be gradually dissoluted in a form of consensual contract around each society would be built, and this, the name of this consensual context is, of course, liberal democracy in its now liberal version. Um, uh, but somehow this violence stay hidden, somehow latent, right? As uh, Melicia pointed out, in the very kind of networks of power or structures of power and the walls and, and barriers and all the systems through which we have to fly through or pass through. So there's a kind of latent violence which implies systems of exclusion and inclusion. That is to say, uh, what we thought would be gradually dissolved, in fact, uh, is present throughout, right? Uh, but it's monopolized by certain actors, certain characters, or certain institutional arrangements which have the power to enforce this violence at different degrees and by which we have to operate. So therefore, should we displace, dislocate the possibility of violence from its locus of power and take it violence as a means of intervention, that is to say, violating the very laws of this contract, of this consensual contract around which we operate in the art world, in the academia, whatever you are, that's not really, uh, I think, in my point of view, what really matters. But can we take violence as a mode of operation, that is to say, to violate uh, 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 the very rules of this contract which monopolize uh, uh, the very means of violence in order to expose disorder, right? Uh, and to debunk them, that is to say, can art take violence as a means of operating? <laughs> oh, please, yes, sure. Now we have also a microphone, one at least, perhaps even one more. <coughs> Um, okay, so <clears throat> to kind of uh, think about Paolo's question and also um, the, the notion of the exhibition and the exposition, uh, I think we, I'd like to go back to the very first uh, presentation. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard's uh, film. Um, and I think what's, uh, what, what's apparent to me in this, uh, within the kind of the act of naming it, which is, I think, very important, this, um, the name he gives to the film. Um, is... Um, a kind of suggestion that perhaps um, th this violence is the violence of the archive itself. And that what the archive, because of the archival nature uh, of, the, of the film, what, what the archive actually does is that it prevents us from forgetting. And I think forgetting here, for me, is a, a specific term. Because I think there's a misunderstanding about forgetting, what forgetting actually means. Because most of us realize that forgetting or consider forgetting as a kind of negative act, uh, uh, an act of, let's say, the annihilation of memory to kind of completely delete your memory. While actually forgetting is a positive 
uh, act. It's an act of construction. Because when we forget, we, <clears throat> we have to um, exert a lot of energy, psychological uh, uh, energy, to construct fleeting, uh, let's say, uh, fleeting connections between things, uh, to touch upon things, to uh, connect to deep psychological uh, um, processes with uh, poetics, with uh, language, with um, daily life around us, to construct something that enables us, enables us to deal with a trauma, with a situation, with a problem, with a hurt, with an anger. So, I think what the film was trying to say, in many ways, was that although these acts of, let's say, um, violence, they were, vi they were all uh, second-hand accounts of violence. Um, <clears throat> and these second-hand accounts of violence, uh, let's say, let's call them representations of violence, uh, they actually prevent us somehow from uh, going through that very complex notion of forgetting. <clears throat> and what most uh, of us think forgetting is, this, this idea of to, to, to be healed, to be cured, is to uh, wipe out your, your hardware, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> Now, I think th this brings me to, um, to what an exhibition can do. And I think what an exhibition can do, I mean, then there's the other connection that I'd like to make is um, when Denise played that um, uh, hip-hop song uh, with, the, with the line of, um, with the line uh, where uh, he was saying something like, um, the time, or I'm not sure if it was the time or the place, the time I th that I come from, the place that I come from will never uh, return. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this line for me encapsulates, uh, uh, let's say, um, um, a trend in thought that's uh, that been accumulating over the past few years. Um, which is, I would say, the trend that, that, that surpasses, that is the will to surpass the archive, in a way. Um, <clears throat> the will to, um, not to annihilate the archive, but to surpass it, to surpass its, its um, let's say, its hegemony on our imagination on our uh, constructive ideas, uh, on a constructive process of forgetting, let's say. In order to allow us to progress, but not in the, let's say, the traditional idea of progression, but the uh, idea of progression as something that is not related to, let's say, a techno-scientific domain. Uh, <clears throat> Because as we know, what progression has become now, it's basically reduced to progression in, um, you know, the techno-scientific domain. It's, it's just become uh, something that uh, is rather detached from, uh, uh, from um, let's say, a more uh, psychologically and emotionally embedded uh, situation. So in many ways, uh, this is also a kind of, uh, using Genet's term, uh, a, a positive violence, uh, I think. Uh, the, uh, and I think this is what the, the exhibition can, or where if the exhibition as a format, as a, a historically uh, um, bound format, as a, as a format that is ancient and full of, you know, 
the, the problematics of its uh, heritage uh, can uh, do anything, uh, it can, I think, initiate processes of forgetting, but forgetting using that kind of definition that I, I pointed out. Um, not just for forgetting's sake, but in order to think of progress as something other than we have always thought of progress as. Yes, I think that's, that's all I can say. Um, I have a question, comment for Mercedes, because we are talking about the exhibition and that was the performance. And uh, in your, as you as you're performing, um, I felt provoked because I felt like her, um, and then she ate me, and then she died. Um, that so, and then you spoke in Spanish for a long time, which was pretty cool because they're so good at becoming somebody else and then in a way provoking me to think of her as being, as listening or somehow not being that, you know, the person who is narrating the game. Um, so that, that provocation felt like violence, but then the violence was out also in eating me and then and then dying. I mean, you don't even become something else. Can you talk more, a, a bit about, about that, um, that, that female, I think? <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, I, I think I, un I understand, I hope. <laughs> um, what I tried to, to bring here was a uh, an excess of something through the voice and some gestures, uh, but at the same time, um, it's an excess that somehow it is constrained. And, and I knew it was going to be for a moment that I will be delivering something. And, and uh, I, I guess that as uh, for the audience, that's also that's also in a way imposed to them, so you're, you have to listen to this for 15, 20 minutes, and, and then it stops. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted to, to make clear that contrast of sh very, in a very short time, to be subject, to be exposed to, to that excess. You know? Very personal question. So, when she, well, the first time you, you, you say it, she doesn't, I think she doesn't die, and then she died. Was it yoga? Breathe, relax. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, it was really good. <laughs> because that is also, because then it was about the body, was it? I mean, you were making a commentary on the body, even though it wasn't explicit, but it was so much there. And then there's so much that we can say about all these different ways in which we try to, you know, control the body, be healthy, and then you took it to death. And that was absolutely beautiful. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to connect to that. Uh, was there a question? Was there someone? Sorry, I just wanted to say as well, if anyone in the audience would like to make a comment, um, I have the microphone here. You can raise your hand, and I'll try and get it to you as soon as possible. No, I would. I may allow me to connect to that really, for me, very difficult and complex kind of constellation or moment to violate the laws in which we operate that Paolo brought in. I mean, this kind of concepts of violence that. Um, uh, a contradiction and ambivalence in itself. And uh, I remember we had a presentation and a talk with Mark Fisher. He is a theorist and a blogger, and he wrote that really amazing book, Capitalist Realism, Is There No Alternative? And he gave a presentation on uh, called After the Event in relation to the London riots. It was one, two years ago. And we discussed quite extensively whether 
uh, the term violence, from which perspective and which place has defined what violence is. And particularly also when we talk about the riots, the media kind of uh, communication and the uh, codification, stereotypization of what, how violence looks like. And I think this is something in the Godard film uh, we can connect to these images from a perspective to we might know what violence is because we are taught how violence looks like in terms of injured bodies, dead bodies, the victims of the war. And uh, so there is a very clearly defined uh, relationship, a binary relationship. And with Mark we have been discussing, okay, violence seems to be introduced by the state in terms of saying this is, a, is an act of violence, the people should not, like, burn the cars and should not loot the shops and so on. So, um, uh, does, it, does it kind of request from us to think about violence in a different way as, for example, uh, militancy? In terms of, I mean, the, all the discussion around the image, we uh, um, kind of the um, uh, violence, uh, in terms of uh, how the image could disturb the regulations of the of the law that we have, to, like for example, in the third cinema, which is another kind of train of thought that we didn't discuss today so much, but um, where uh, it relates maybe to some extent to that what Adrien Laroche was referring to, uh, the book that could be uh, could operate as a murder, that the book could operate as an intervention that is violent, but from, a, from below, from a perspective from below, to also claim the right to uh, announce and claim the right of definition what violence is. But I would like to kind of, since Genet has been introducing violence and brutality as one possibility, should we maybe also be aware of the usage of the term violence in terms of its liberating forces, its liberating potential. And uh, I mean, I, I, this is really some I'm, the struggle that I'm going with because the moment when you talk, well, I think violence is really important and to deal with from its other perspective, from its perspective from below. So, I mean, uh, how do we deal with that? So I, I, I just want to reply on this because this uh, touches in uh, the situation that we are living now in my country, Brazil, our country. Uh, so Brazil has, is going now to several protests on the streets and one of the central characteristics of this process is that we have the so-called black blocks, uh, which emerged during the Seattle movements against the pacts of, of free trade market in the 90s, a kind of tactics. Uh, which, which seeks to protect protesters, but also uh, there is a direct aggression to symbols of capital, i.e. banks, for example. And um, when uh, the media, uh, the Brazilian media talks about, for example, protests in Europe, they call the guys who are on the streets protesters. When they report on the media that is within our country, they call it uh, vandalos. Uh, I would know vandals, right? Vandals is that the right word? Yeah, right. So there is there is a kind of let's say regime of visibility in which you define what is a sort of legitimate violence in front of the monopoly of violence that the state has to rule. And this, this, this regime of, 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 of visibility, it's, it's also a kind of media discourse, right? In, watch, in, in what signifies and what really uh, 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 is a sort of violence which, okay, this violence is outside of the contract. And then in parallel, we have one of the most murderous police forces in the world, uh, which kills 2,000 people at least uh, 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 every year. So uh, I think the question what you just announced, the definition of violence or kind of breaking up this regime of visibility, which is in fact a kind of just an extension of, of, of an entire 
field of violence distributed through the social body and which really uh, shapes our perception. There is a kind of like subjective violence by which we kind of perceive the world. And this is perhaps the most important point for us to break and understand that, uh, you know, in order to uh, do some sort of counter-hegemonic or militant, uh, whatever you say, or to change this stuff, we need to, to kind of reframe and kind of demonopolize uh, the definition of violence by the state itself uh, and uh, its uh, proxies, uh, the, uh, the media and all this regime of visibility, that's what. Can use this one. Um, yeah, viol violence, violence is a problem. Though I think Jeanette's uh, distinction between violence and brutality is, is very helpful in that sense. Um, but anyway, so what I was trying to, to say doing that you know, short, long genealogy of violence, I was to emphasize how violence has always, has always already, at least in modern thinking, being with the necessary, the other side of the law. So in the critical legal the, the tradition, the recent tradition of critical legal theorizing, that is the core of our critique of the law, drawing from obviously Derrida and Benjamin and uh, others. So, so, to, so as if, if you think in terms of antagonism, for instance, which comes from the Marxist tradition, right? Uh, so the mili militancy in terms of antagonism is always already caught in that the violence that defines its outside as, well, criminal, right? As, as the, the, thing, the state of nature. Because in, in, in the description of, um, of opposition as antagonism, in, which is the opposition, most violent position as opposed, you know, opposed to being liberal and you know, sitting, sitting around the table negotiating, making deals, um, the move is towards uh, displacing the ones occupying the seat of power, the proper seat of violence, right? Um, and uh, Balibar goes a bit over, not so much into, but a bit over in that, in that piece. So when I, th when I think about confrontation and exposure, it's precisely thinking in terms of not being, uh, not standing in opposition as an, in, in antagonism just to replace uh, those who are occupying the proper seat of violence, but actually exposing the workings of violence, including these, the criminalization of improper violence, uh, and well, yeah, along with the criminalization of others. And I think that's what points, I like to think points towards, you know, what comes after the point of no return, which is not just a reproduction of what it was, now I am. Uh, in the position of uh, of the subject, um, with of of power, and that's, I was going to say something else, uh, but thank you. That's I think really crucial. Um, this, uh, I mean, also what uh, it connects to uh, that to interrupt the chain of transaction uh, to reproduce violence, not by showing the explanation of violence, but maybe by showing or exposing, making public the violation of the law. I mean, what kind of means of articulation are necessary in order to step out of explanation? Maybe explanation is another word for representation. I'm actually quite thankful that we have another opening towards this entire discussion, uh, that uh, to step out, kind of, to interrupt the narrative of violence, but rather to, and this, I think here we come in with the question of the relation towards violence and uh, the possibilities also of acts of violation. And I think maybe this is also where we or the space of art, artistic practice plays an absolutely crucial role. Because, I mean, we, have, we are always able to invent the means of articulation without necessarily following certain cultural codifications, social constructedness, um, but propose something else. And, uh, but I would like really to hear from uh, the audience. I mean, uh, it's my first visit to Dublin, and for a few of us, perhaps even as well. And um, what is your uh, 
what kind of thoughts got triggered uh, after listening to... I mean, violence is something that uh, departs from Ireland <laughs> over and over again. And I mean, that's what we hear via the news media uh, from time to time. And it would be really extremely interesting to listen to your thoughts and commentaries and fragmented reflections. So please, Basam. Can I pose as Irish for a second? Um, I think uh, to, to just uh, kind of like um, to comment on, on Paolo's and Denise's uh, uh, last uh, kind of uh, bit about uh, I think um, <clears throat> but I uh, really agree with you both in, in many ways, but I, I also can see that um, that that there's something slightly more complicated that is very difficult to kind of uh, the to explain, and perhaps it's about not about, but perhaps it's connected to. Um, to the, 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 the absolute plasticity uh, of information, um, where, um, let's say, uh, uh, political ideas are no longer, they're no longer, uh, they no longer have a body anymore, you know. Um, so they travel and they, they kind of, uh, generate, uh, let's say, they generate, um, what's the word? <laughs> uh, results, uh, affects that become extremely entangled and very difficult to unpack. Um, so one of these, for example, images is the, the very kind of, let's say, violent and haunting image of uh, Muammar Gaddafi being uh, brought to his death, you know, by a group of people who, uh, of course, I mean, we can we can we can say, let's say, if we put them here as the uh, um, as the the the, uh, the counterparts of the Black Bloc, for example. Uh, we would we could say that you know the brutality of Gaddafi, according to Janae's uh, kind of uh, description, uh, this is what brought on the violence, which could be also a, a good explanation. This kind of you know huge aggression, um, but I think it's also that. Uh, what we realize is that uh, what this act did and what, would, what it was based on was also a, a violation of, uh, uh, of the country itself by uh, international forces that are related to neoliberal capitalism. Um, and later, what happened in Libya was that uh, many of these people who we didn't know who exactly uh, they are uh, turned out to be Islamic militants. And, you know, it becomes extremely, extremely sophisticated. And it, it's not something we can easily kind of, let's say, um, what I'm trying to say basically is that simplifications of violence into enemy and victim no longer withstand in, in, in contemporary society, in many, many cases. So I think while we, 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 we think of people like Janae, we have to also consider that they were thinkers of their time. And that now, with this uh, extreme malleability of information, with, with this kind of, you know, uh, proliferation of, 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 of uh, un, un, unrootedness of ideas and identities, I think. Uh, it's become much more sophisticated to kind of uh, unpack this notion. 
will be brief. No, but we, we could go back, um, and I'm telling myself to go back to the old language of ideology, even though I don't want to use the language of ideology to explain what I'm going to say. Um, I agree. Uh, we cannot uh, just easily, and I don't think we should even want to separate and have a clear line of the good people, the bad people, the enemy, and the friend in the old ways of, um, that the political describe, like if you think of Schmidt, Schmidt and the f for definition of the political. But uh, we also know under, in, in the global present how that is, there, there is a way, a very effective way of distinguishing between good violence and bad violence. And one is terror, the other one is freedom, right? Good violence is always in the name of freedom. Bad violence is terrorism. It's not about the who, it's about the what and the how, and against whom uh, it's done. So I wanna keep, I think some distinctions we can make, even though we can no longer just divide the world as I think even my generation uh, could uh, 25 years ago. I just want to make a very, very brief point. I totally agree with you both. Uh, it's actually an absolutely, absolutely fascinating uh, discussion that we could unfold uh, for many hours. But I think you are precisely right. The, the, the kind of epistemic frame in which history has been told to us is the perpetrator and the victim, right? And this is the way we kind of learn history. And this is very problematic. Uh, and, um, and this is a question to be unfolded, absolutely. I think a lot of um, the language that we use, well, I think a lot that we have to think about the ownership of language, and I think a lot of it goes back to colonial um, ownership of language and this whole victimization and projection of um, what the former colonies, how they behaved and how they depended on the colonial nations to go in. And I think a lot of the language that, that we are now speaking of the problems of, that we have this conversation about it now, um, it stems not maybe not directly from there, but it certainly was very, very significantly influenced. And, I, and going back to what you we were saying earlier about intervention and exposition, I, th I think this is a very important way to think for stepping forward. And I think there's, we, ha we have to, in our interventions, redefine the whole territory. And, you know, we have to think of ways forward where we are challenging this. I don't know if I'm making myself very clear, but I, I think a lot of it does go back to the colonial history of the world. Plus lots of other things, anyways. Yeah, I... Um, the descriptors, uh, the descriptions we have... Uh, I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. Basim in Egypt, for instance, the different narratives. There's two very extreme narratives, mm -hmm. and reality is many shades of grey. You know, it's like these projections of what's happening by one so-called opposition on another, and it's totally futile. It has, like you're saying, it has no meaning anymore. It, it's old hat. It has no use. It's redundant. We need to redefine this territory. It's terribly important. It's terribly important. And I, I like, this is one of the things I like about uh, the work that Paulo was showing, because in a way it also allows us to, um, to trace the deployments of the, the, the colonial in what appears to be basically technological or economic development uh, project, right? So, it, and perhaps, perhaps we have become post-structuralists. I have a friend who says now that Deleuze was right, didn't believe him 20 years ago, and here we are. And I'm becoming <laughs> more of a post-structuralist in, 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 in the sense, in the, in the in modern Foucault, not so much Derrida's version of it, in the sense that, um, of course, Foucault 
gave us the notion of the biopolitical, which uh, now I, I can see more and more as a management of death rather than a management of life, but I'm not going to call it necropolitics. But in Paulo's, in Paulo's presentation, we can see how the juridical political moment of power, which is a moment of authorized violence, how we can see its inscriptions. Uh, and those inscriptions are um, made, done, sometimes by our friends, like in the case of the Brazilian government now. Um, so, and then, and then for me, it's really a personal political crisis. My comrades are the enemies at that moment. And talk, speaking back at home, nobody can understand how I can even say that unless I refer to the indigenous movements and the rural movements uh, of people who are resisting this, turn, this return to the expropriation, uh, no, uh, extraction of natural resources. That is, you know, exactly another moment of uh, of colonization. Maybe that's a way of tracing. Um, it may not allow us to identify. Friends, maybe we don't want to really identify friends, but at least the, the modalities of deployment of power that ha that benefit global capital the most and brings more harm to the same um, former colonial and still uh, subjected to colonial practices uh, everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Um, I want to bring up something emerging from what Bassem was saying about new conditions that exist now and how they would differentiate um, maybe thinking about, about violence um, compared to past uh, conditions because the, something that hasn't really been touched upon is the relationship between um, the logic, let's say the violence that we might think is inherent in the logic of representation and how new technologies have been factored into um, violent upheavals, for example in Egypt especially where the speed of translation of an act of violence into a representational image through people, you know, uh, putting something up online extremely quickly. That, that, that particular relationship of speed between an act of violence and its transformation into a representational image. So I'm thinking in terms of if, if, we, if we take for granted that there is some sort of inherent um, violence within the logic of representation itself, in philosophical and political terms, then these new conditions that we're seeing, where you have violent upheavals, where you have micro-revolutions, revolutions being, you know, uh, having a certain speed, a certain um, dynamic and energy, which is quite different to maybe previous times. Uh, what does do the panel think, or anybody here? What 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 is the sense of, uh, of 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 that link and the solidification of that link, and what kinds of dangers are involved in terms of um, how the digital is being seen? Uh, the, the use of, of putting images up like this really quickly is seen as some kind of innocent, neutral, um, informational system, as opposed to something which which is reinforcing a representational model of thought, which might have um, a problem embedded within that. Um, and I'm, I'm, just as a follow-up, I was going to say that uh, the Godard was coming up a lot in my mind as well in terms of Histoire de Cinema and the, the section where he shows, it's Elizabeth, Elizabeth Taylor at Auschwitz, it's, it's actually written about by Alan Wright, uh, how he uh, juxtaposes the image of, let's say, the concentration camps with the history of cinema in terms of that, that scene with Elizabeth Taylor. I think that, that is something that... Uh, in, it reminds me of how much Goddard was approaching, uh, undercutting the system of representation and trying to show this rupture in the image in a way which, which was um, looking at violence in a certain way. There was another question. Not anymore. Oh. Thank you. I don't know if it is, if it is a, a, a question, there, but there is, I think it's me coming into agreement to, to some of the things that, that, that were said and how one expresses it, and me just some, uh, perhaps, yeah, uh, a doubt of some sort as well, because when, when I, I speak, when I hear um, violence, and theoretically speaking, I come from a... a, a a country that, that has a, a recent uh, history of, uh, 
of violence, but I think about water really, you know, uh, 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 like violence is, is somewhat like, like water in the sense that uh, uh, we, we, we need water, but we can have too much of it, we can have too little of it, and we need to, to, to control it, and we need to distribute it, we need to uh, cease it somehow. And then the other Im the image becomes like violence, uh, almost like a synonym of water. And then I think of a woman uh, uh, um, in labor, you know, or, or the whole process of being pregnant. Uh, 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 of a woman, you know, like the whole process, like, and what how violent uh, we can be that, that the change you know provoking in a, in a, in a, in a, in a human being you know in this case a, a female human being and then uh, uh, even the act of birth the labor itself uh, um, this, this, this uh, i think that these two images for me water uh, uh, the process of of giving birth uh, uh, speaks to me as, as in what violence is, in a certain way I could go another way to say the inevitability of it and the constant, uh, uh, there's a, a movement that, that's got to be, there's a movement uh, 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 that uh, uh, is consequent to the existence. We are violent. Violence is part of, of how we grasp new moments, violence, you know, whatever good violence, bad violence, Violence, however you want to look at it, whatever you want to name it, and all that. And I'm not, of course, being despondent to the fact that uh, uh, to think about it and to develop thought about uh, what is what is not relevant. But uh, it is uh, just uh, in terms of I think this was said already. It's just a perspective of saying that it is it seems to be intrinsic to 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 our behavior, you know. And we always kind of we end up talking about the dosage and the context and and. Uh, um, these things and another thing that I would like to to share and, and I heard the panel express this in, in uh, uh, various times uh, you said that uh, lots of you mentioned that uh, I tried what I tried and what I try and uh, uh, I'm very thankful for I don't think you tried anything like in a sense that you did you did uh, my, my comment on this sense is that uh, within the art practice then my comment goes towards that differentiation between action and consequence and uh, uh, sometimes we, we, we do too much into be owners both of the action and of the consequence again I'm not saying that uh, looking at the consequence and analyzing and and you know taking a look at what consequence is and if it's going to be consequent or not I'm not saying that it's not relevant or even crucial to some extent, uh, uh, but I am saying that I think it is extremely important to know that they are not the same thing. And when it comes to art practice and, and the communication with an audience and the exchange of, of these actions and what it is that is happening and what we are maximizing, this uh, differentiation is, uh, I believe, extremely important because then, again, uh, this is what's said here in other words. It becomes the sustainability of anything. Uh, we end up approaching motivation and we tend like what moves us, you know, what moves us to do this and what moves us to do that. And that's, again, the, 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 the simplicity of the question. So uh, the approach that we end up doing and, again, connecting. I'm, I'm just a fucking artist. I don't do much of thinking, you know, the, the, one of the privileges that I take is just to be able to connect my motivation with a capacity to transform it into a perspective, and that's it. Uh, uh, but what I do uh, uh, think is, is in, important to ex just establish these, these, these uh, I don't know, differences of some sort. I think Adrienne uh, and uh, Denise want to say something. I just wanted to, yeah, to, to add a few notes be, before the, the night. Uh, to Bassam was uh, mentioning the, 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 the statement by, by Genet uh, in, in, um, in his defense of the Red Army Fraction, saying that we, we learned through them that uh, the only way to fight against brutality is violence. That was a big mistake. I mean, he said that 
and the same day there was this uh, ab abducement, how do you say that, you know, of Hans Martin Schleier in Germany, uh, who then was found dead in, in, in the trunk of a, of a car a few weeks later. That was a big mistake, and, and Genet was, uh, had, I mean, went through a, a very long um, process of, uh, of depression after that article. There was a big misunderstanding. I mean, I don't want to, I just want to raise a question. I don't want to, to, to make a conclusion, but in a way it was a big mistake and, and, and he's, he himself suffered uh, from, from, what, from this article and this publication. And it took maybe 15 years, you know, to just to, to realize what he has said and, and, and all this question about violence, brutality, the real world, the grammatical world, etc. Anyway, uh, the second thing is when you mentioned the, the woman giving birth as an example of violence, this is very Genet also. <laughs> he used the, the, the example of the plants growing. But I think in the same line to, to my first note that the the, this is more, the violence is against the question of limit, and the, the limit is the body, and the, the limit is the body of the other. And uh, I think one of the basic uh, uh, law that one's, one should uh, uh, follow is, is the, the integrity of the body of the other. So this is where violence must stop. This is where Genet's statement for the redamic fraction was a big mistake. Um, okay, so you, you know what, you understand what I mean. Although to say that the limit is the body of the other is, is not enough because we know also that you can arm, you, I mean, the law is also uh, trying to prevent one person to, to, to be violence against its own body. So it's more complicated, of course. The limit is not outside and inside, and the, the, my body and your body, it's, it's much more intricate. But anyway, and the last thing I wanted to say is, is finally, um, people I'm in, interested in, like Derrida or, or Genet, they are at war with themselves, first of all, you know? The, there are people that, uh, yeah, that are, the violence is also uh, something they, they, they inhibit. They are at war with themselves, and of course, this gives way to very, to very strong books or <laughs> statements or, or anything. But first of all, this is a war that they that they that they live within, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, to the question about the social media, um, it makes me think about how easy it is, I mean, I shouldn't say how easy we forget, but it makes me think about the difference between uh, industrial capital and the explicitly physical dimension of expropriation through long hours and difficult, harsh uh, working conditions. And now global capital and, and then, you know, these, all the technology that comes with it. And the ways in which we do work for it, we do uh, add to the profit and reproduction of financial capital just by being active online, by liking something on Facebook or by sharing something that you do on Google. So that is an economic, that is the economic aspect of, of the social media that is very crucial uh, in the context of speaking about the political. And then, of course, that is the ontological, not the ontological, the existential difference and that lots of people have been writing about uh, how it affects us in different ways. But in relationship to, to, to what you, you, you were saying about the, how you know, things that happen in different places then become so um, you know, widespread so quickly via the social media, the other side of it is the repression, is the physical repression, the state repression of those things that actually are happening. So in the, on the one hand, it seems that we have all been liberated and we can be political on Facebook, but when I am political and I share something that is happening in Brazil on Facebook, I'm also sharing the fact that the police 
and now the army and the national security force are occupying spaces in Rio de Janeiro or in the Amazon uh, forest. So it's, it, it, it's very complicated. Now to the question of violence, your initial point about violence, um, I, don't, I don't think that a woman giving birth is, a, at least in terms of violence, with, with the juridical inflection, and then I think I'm referring to what Adrian said, uh, suggested, that violence stops at the body of the other. When, I think of, um, when I'm thinking of violence, I'm still thinking in the context of the social. Um, now, there are things that are painful in life. The whole process of becoming, coming to be in time and space, has to be painful because what precedes time and space has to be organized in a certain way, and I'm talking quantum physics now, and, and time and space is constraining, is limiting. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily violent in the same sense that I'm using uh, the term violence. It's painful, it's horrible, something should not happen. And they do because of uh, our conditions of existence. Uh, but violence in the juridical inflection is different. It's about relationships and, and, about, and also, I think, about predict predictability, um, the violence of the law against the outside of the law has already, is possible, justified because the outside of the law has already been inscribed by the law itself. And that's the kind of violence, um, anyway, that I have in mind. Um, can I quickly intervene? I, I think in terms of our, uh, uh, use of the space, we might be coming to the end of our time, so I, I might suggest that we could uh, reconvene down the hill in Murray's and to continue the conversations, but wanted to um, just on, on behalf of um, Eva and Bassam um, to thank uh, Yasmin, Adrien, uh, uh, Mercedes, Paolo, Denise, Doreen and Milika very, very much for today's presentations that have been invigorating and engaging, um, uh, but perhaps we could continue um, in the pub down the hill, and um, we'd, I think, thank, thank you everyone for remaining with us throughout the day, and also thank you very much to the Anna Lynn Foundation for making today's event possible. So perhaps we could um, uh, warm up in a pub with a pint. As well. Okay, thank you very much, Woodrow. <laughs> there is, I think, much more to discuss and to say, and uh, maybe only like a very last thing that uh, a sentence that kept walking in my mind only the criminal can solve the crime. And uh, I don't know where I've read it, and uh, that I think relates so quite um, a lot to this aspect of um, that there is an absolute kind of the limit that we have reached in terms of reflecting on the conditions of production from a perspective kind of distanced, but rather a kind of reflection on our complicity with the system and the laws we are operating in, which I think puts a totally different perspective on um, the question also what I think Denise has been pointing towards uh, to understand the kind of conditions and the mechanisms of the relations that we inhabit. And I think this is um, uh, quite something maybe to continue later on. And I also would like to thank the contributors very much indeed and Wutro, Kanohan, Noel Collins and of course Pasam. Alvaroni, very much indeed, and the audience, thank you. <laughs>